everybody's here. Shall we get started? <laughs> I hope you, I didn't give you the wrong message by posting the lectures on YouTube that you like should not come here. <laughs> That's not what I wanted at all. <laughs> if I don't have an audience, they're gonna be pretty boring lectures, I think. <laughs> Okay, so let's start by recapping from what we what we ended with. So the last time we talked about inner product, right? About vectors. So I'll, I'll actually try to recap it just like this. So if I have like one one vector from R to N, which is n dimensional uh, vector space over the reals, and I have another vector W from R to N, is it visible? Does it work? <laughs> Then what was the dot product of the two? I, I denote it as V dot N, uh, sorry, V dot W. And how was it defined? Just someone tell me quickly. <laughs> it's a sum oh, from one to N of all the components, right? V I times W I. So that's my inner product or dot product or scalar product. One of the simplest things you can find in linear algebra. Oh, one thing I should have probably also mentioned before, another uh, very basic thing is so if I have a scalar alpha and another scalar beta, then I can do alpha v plus beta w. Sometimes I denote vectors with these arrows when I'm just writing, writing it with hand just to make a difference between scalars and vectors. So these are scalars here. And those are those are vectors. So do you know how this this thing is called? If I take two vectors, I scale them by some scalars, and I sum it together, it's called li li linear combination of vectors. Um, let's just write it here: linear combination. And here we have a linear combination of just two vectors, but you can repeat the thing and do it for as many vectors as you want. The idea is that you take every single vector, you multiply it by a scalar, and then you sum, sum all of them together. Just looking at the textbook, I recommend it to you, which is actually pretty cool. If you haven't already checked it out, then they make uh, uh, lots of the first chapters about linear combinations. It's, it's really very simple. So why was the dot product interesting to us? The sort of, sort of one thing we already showed the last time was that we can define a norm of the Euclidean norm squared of vector, which is just the scalar product of the vector with itself, v dot v, right? And I said that the, this, the norm, the Euclidean norm, so if I don't take the square, in other words, if I put there a square root, v dot v, so I'm just recapitulating what we had the last time, I just I'm writing it at hand to give you like a slightly different perspective. So what was this thing? If I have a vector and I take its Euclidean norm, meaning I do the, the square, I could also write it this way, right? I could also do like square root, and here it's sort of, sort of more interesting because you see the, the guts of the computations there. What is it? Geometrically? Huh? The length of the vector, exactly. So I can be imagining my vectors if I have some coordinate system and there is my zero right here. So I can be imagining my vector as an arrow. If this is, though, this is the case of R2, right? Most examples will be in R2 because that's easy to draw. So this is my V1 or Vx and this is my V2. And this length is just the square root of V1 squared plus V2 squared. And it works for arbitrary dimensional vectors. That's what's cool, cool about linear algebra. It actually lets us reason in a principled way about arbitrarily dimensioned spaces. OK. So I think that's pretty much summing up what we did the last time, right? You guys have any questions? Yeah? Yeah, so let me repeat that question so we also have it on the record because <laughs> I, I noticed that you, this, the camera doesn't really, or the, the microphone doesn't really pick you up. So the question of if I can do a dot product between vectors of different dimensions, that's a very logical question to ask and the answer is no. <laughs> it's not really defined. It's only, it's only defined for vectors of, of, the, of the same vector space really. So yeah, very, very good question, thanks. Any other questions? 
Now, there is, there is ways how we can generalize things, right? We can go from real vectors to complex vectors. In that case, the, the scalars will be also complex numbers. But I haven't seen a reasonable definition of inner product for two different vector spaces. It will probably be something, some, some different type of mathematical abstraction. Okay, so let's move on and let's move on to more inner product properties. I think I show, oh, this is the, the last thing I think I showed the last time. It's very, very trivial, right? It's the commutativity of dot product. So it means that V dot W is the same as W dot V. It's really trivial for the dot product, right? Because, because of the commutativity of just real multiplication. But it's very good. It's very cool that this property holds. It's not for, we will see later, that's not for granted. <laughs> and it has a lots of implications. All right, so let's see what other properties, what. So what we are trying to ultimately get to is the geometric interpretation of dot product. Maybe you already know this, but let's, let's try to work out some more uh, properties. So I already said that it's commutative. Uh, that's exactly this, yeah. So this is what I said the last time. I don't have to go through that again. Don't worry, all this, all this stuff is will, will get more and more interesting. <laughs> so here is uh, another interesting property. It's a distributivity with respect to scalar multiplication. So what's going on here, I take a dot product between V and alpha times W, where alpha is a scalar. V and W are the vectors from the same n-dimensional vector space. And I want to show that this is the same as taking first dot product between V and W and then multiplying it by the scalar. Again, very simple thing to want. So how do we prove it? Well, by simple calculation, right? So just from the definition, so alpha times W is just multiplying every component of the vector by alpha, right? And then by definition of uh, dot product, this is what I will get. So this is just alpha W the ith element of alpha w. And because the multiplication of real numbers is distributive, I can take the alpha outside of the sum, right? That's, that's just distributivity of real, um, mul real number multiplication and addition. I think it's distributivity of addition over multiplication or the other way around, something like that. The point is that I can take the alpha out and what I have here, well, just a dot product, right? Just v times w, so that is, that's this. So I can write, I have proven this very important relationship that it doesn't matter if I first multiply the W with alpha and then do the dot product with V or first do the dot product V times W and then multiply with alpha. So this is really algebraic thing, right? Uh, algebra is really excited about like discovering these properties. It's actually, if l later we will see, it's essentially discovering symmetries in, 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 our, in our system. That's what like group, group theory is about. So this is like a very simple thing, but I'm just trying to uh, motivate you that it's, it's a basis for uh, doing more exciting things. So I suppose this is clear or is there something not Did I Any questions? No. All right. So here we have another property, which is a different type of distributivity. Here we are asking if it matters if we first do a vector addition and then the dot product, or first we do two separate dot products and then vector addition. So in this case, we assume that U, V, and W are all vectors in the same dimension real vector space. And again, we just, we just write it out, right? So what is the ith component of vector V plus W? Well, just summing the components, right? So it's just VI plus WI. I apply the definition of dot product. And again, by distributivity of real numbers, I can split it into these two sums. And these two sums are nothing but individual dot products. So this is just u dot. I really love the capability of being able to annotate things in real time. Does it also work on, on that? And because I'm not watching it. So <laughs> maybe, maybe I can do a little better job with the focus. Right? Is it a little better? And this is just the u times, times meaning the dot product u times w. So that's this. So I have proven this property. Oh no, I accidentally 
and over it. I just wanted to highlight it that this, this is the distributivity property of inner product with respect to vector addition. Clear? I think so. Maybe if you haven't had this somewhere before. Not elementary school. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> okay, so the, the cool thing about like mathematics is once you like build some 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 rules, once you learn some properties, you prove some theorems, then you can use them to prove more. So that's exactly what, what we can do here, right? So let's see if you want to compute a dot product between A plus B and C plus D. So I can just apply twice the rule I just proven, the, the, the distributive rule, right? So here I'm just using, uh, here I'm just assuming that C plus D is just some vector and I apply the distributivity from the left. So I distribute, distribute the, the first product. So I, I can write that this is the same as A dot product C plus D plus B dot product C plus D, right? So I applied the distributivity and I was looking at this, I just blur my eyes a little bit. I just assume the C plus D already is a vector. And the next step is just applying the distributivity to these two parts separately. So A dot product C plus D is, is I can distribute. So it's A dot product C plus A dot product D. So that's, that's this first part. And the same way for the second part, B times C plus D is B times C plus B times D. So <clears throat> this gives us uh, for the special case that C plus D is just A plus B again, this gives us the following <coughs> formula. You've probably seen uh, the, the scalar version of these formulas before, right? Like you know that if I have just x, y real numbers, one of the very basic formulas is this, right? 2xy plus y squared, right? You know, you know this. That's, I don't know how about you, but we had it at high school. So this is basically uh, the same sort of identity for vectors. So uh, again, this is this is just applying the first uh, thing to uh, a plus b dot product with itself, which is the norm squared. So if I work it work it out, it's it's exactly the same computation except that instead of c plus d, I'm writing a plus b. So I'm again applying twice the distributivity. And here, here I apply another thing. Here I notice, aha, uh -huh, here I have A times B and B times A. And remember, the very first thing we proved was that there is, it's commutative, right? So B dot A is exactly the same thing as A dot B. So these two things are the same. So they both form this two, I can put them together. So it's just two A dot B. And again, this is a dot product. The A dot A is a dot product of A with itself. So it's the square norm of A. And the same thing for the B. So I came up with this formula, which is going to be important for us. It will actually lead us or illustrate the geometric interpretation of the dot product. That's, that's what I'm actually trying to get to. So this is all clear. Very good. And we are slowly but surely getting to the cosine rule. So I guess we can start looking at this picture. So here I have two vectors. I have my V and W. In this case, they are both from R2, but it doesn't really matter much if they were from Rn. It would work exactly the same way, except that I couldn't just draw this simple diagram. And what I can look at is the difference between V and W, right? That's this vector, this, this guy here, that's the V minus W. So this is this, is this, this thing. And from the thing I just showed on the previous slide, I can use I can use it here on V and minus W. So what we previously had an, as A will now be V, and what we previously had as B is going to be minus W here. So instead of plus, I put there minus. That, that's that's fine. It's, it still 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 works exactly the same way. And the only thing that changes that instead of plus here, I will have minus, right? So I get this this formula for, so what is the V minus 
w uh, squared. Well, that's again just length. That's length of this segment, right? Squared. Right? So this, this can remind you something from trigonometry. And here we are start, starting to see, again, the, the relationship to geometry, right? Because this is a totally a geometric thing. So let's look, look at the cosine rule. What does the cosine rule tell us? All right, maybe I can draw a picture similar to this one. So the cosine rule tells us that if I have a triangle, let's say, and there are, these are the lengths of the sides of the triangle, ABC, and here is some angle alpha. And the cosine rule, let's see if I get it right. It's easy to get it wrong. A squared plus B squared minus A B cosine of alpha. And this should be twice. So this is the cosine rule. So the cosine rule basically tells me a relationship or between lengths of edges in a triangle. So if I know the length of this edge, A, and I know the length of this edge, and I know the angle, then I can compute the length of the opposite edge, the C, and I compute it us exactly using this formula. I'm not gonna do yet formal homework, but if you wanted to do something homeworky, then you can think about like why the cosine rule is true. Well, how would you prove the cosine rule? <laughs> and you can of course go to Wikipedia and then you will find it there, but it's more fun to think about it first for yourselves. Nevertheless, the, the cosine rule is true. So if I write it in terms of our vectors, this, the cosine rule, so th that's exactly the same situation here, right? So here is my opposite edge to, to this angle. Maybe I could do it like this, and this angle is here. So the square length of the b minus w, that's, that's this, this guy squared, is the length of b squared plus the length of w squared minus twice, and now the length of b times the length of w times the cosine of the angle, right? And now here's the funny thing, look, look at these two things. So this is, this is the same thing, right? This is just the length of v minus w squared. Here it's the same thing, right? So these two things, they have to be equal, right? So if I put there just like equal here, then these guys already are the same, obviously. And this, so, so what I get from it is that minus two V dot W has to be the same as minus two V norm of V, norm of W cosine theta, right? I can get rid of the minus twos and I end up with this end up essentially with the geometric interpretation of dot product. That <coughs> is that the dot product of V and W is the length of W, uh, sorry, length of V times the length of W, the Euclidean norm, times cosine of the angle these two vectors have in between them, the, the angle between the two vectors. So that's actually something pretty cool, right? I like. This V times W, that's actually, this is just the sum, if it, were, if it were general vectors, VI, WI. And it's not obvious at all to me that this should be this, should be this right? Again, these, these lengths, I can also write them using sums, right? This is just like the square root of the sum of VI squared. Can you still read it? You can, right? It's pretty good. Come on. They said the same way for the W. So this is something that's not totally trivial, right? Yet it's very, very important. The cool thing is that this works not just for 2D or 3D vectors. So in, in 3D vectors, I could do the same way, right? I would just have to think about 3D arrows. But if I have n-dimensional vectors, so for example, I can, what, what could be like, so for example, images, right? If I have an image, 256 by 256 monochrome image, like in, in, in PNG or something, some image you took with your camera, and I have another image, I can say that these are vectors in 256 squared, so 65,000 something, dimensional vector space, and I can compute 
if I normalize these vectors, I can compute the angle between them. And the angle essentially tells me how similar or different they are, right? If there is a small angle between them, they are close. If there is a larger angle, they are more and more different. Let's actually look into that. The cl be close being similar and larger angle being different. So here is, here is the one of the geometric interpretations of dot product. So the one thing we can observe, so maybe I will just write it here again. So V times W equals the norm of V. You, you really have to remember this. This is very basic property. So notice that the norm of V and norm of W, they have to be non-negative, right? There's no way nor its length, right? Cannot be negative. Cosine, cosine can be negative, right? So how does cosine look like? So if I'm not mistaken, let's get this wrong, but I think cosine looks something like this, right? Starts at one. Then once I get to pi half, I'm at zero. And once I get to pi, I am at minus one, right? So regardless of the lengths from the dot product, I can actually already read something about the vectors. I can learn something about them, right? Specifically, if the dot product is positive, if it's greater than zero, and remember, the dot product is always a scalar, right? Dot product is something that takes two vectors of the same dimension and returns me a scalar. So the scalar can be either positive, zero, or negative, right? So what does it mean if it's positive? Well, that means because these, these guys are positive, they don't matter. That means that the cosine has to be positive, right? So that means that the angle between these two vectors has to be between zero and 90 degrees, or pi half, if you like radians better. So what it means geometrically? Geometrically, it means that these two vectors are sort of close, are closer together than 90 degrees. Their angle between them, their relative angle is less than 90 degrees. Very special case is when V dot product W is zero. In this case, what does it mean? If V and W are not zero vectors, they must have non-zero length, right? So the only way this can be zero is if the cosine of theta is zero. And that only happens when we are at Y half. So there is exactly 90 degrees angle between them. So this would be like the right angle here. And this is such a special case that it has a name because in this case we, we say that V and W are orthogonal. We will, we will get back to that because that's a very important thing in linear algebra. But here, here you see it for the first time. So if you take two vectors and it happens that their dot product is zero, that they are orthogonal and it means that the, their angle is exactly 90 degrees. Now, if we go even further, you can probably guess what happens. If the dot product is negative, then it means that the cosine had to be negative, and that means we are somewhere here, so our, bit, so our angle is between 90 and 180 degrees, right? So this, this thing is super basic thing, actually. When I was doing some like interview questions that always like they ask you that if, if they want you for like 3D game programming job and, and you didn't know that, you're out. <laughs> Slightly tricky question, can I go like beyond that? What if, do, can I do like 190 degrees, for example? Like if I was kept rotating this vector W and I brought it like here, for example, could I do something special with it? Or <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's al always, always the shortest angle. <laughs> the same way if, if I had my vector W here, this is also perfectly orthogonal, right? You can see it algebraically if I plug here W or minus W, it doesn't matter. It's going to be zero in both cases, right? So here, here you see a little bit how the algebra and the geometry, they play together and give us basically different ways to look at the same thing. Okay, so remember this very important picture. 
and we will we'll get back to that many times. So I broach the concept of orthogonality. So we say that the two vectors are orthogonal if they have right angle between them. And it really applies to vectors of arbitrary dimension. So like yeah, I said the example of images, right? That I can have 256, 256 images, which are just 65, I think it's 536 dimensional vectors. I can be asking what pictures are orthogonal. I don't know, but it's sort of cool. I guess nerdy <laughs> question. No, it, it will have real real <laughs> real consequences when we'll be talking about transform coding. So it's not, not purely geek a thing. So this is just basically saying the same thing again. If the dot product is zero, relative angle is pi half, and we say that these two vectors are orthogonal. Okay. Here is one cool thing in mathematics which is very closely tied to dot product. It's the Schwartz or Cauchy Schwartz or Cauchy Schwartz Bunyakovsky or Cauchy Bunyakovsky Schwartz inequality. In all, in all cases, it means the same. <laughs> it just depends like how people want to call it. These guys basically discovered it independently and probably many other people discovered it too because it's, it's not trivial, but it's not uh, something uh, not so obvious that <coughs> smart mathematicians would not just come up with it. So you, you could have actually sort of noticed when, we t when I talked about the cosine, what is true about the cosine is that the absolute value of the cosine is always less than one, right? That's also the reason why basically this is true, but we can prove it in a nicer way without the cosine. So let's say what, let's, let's look what the Cauchy-Schwarz or Cauchy-Schwarz Bunyakovsky inequality says. So if I take arbitrary two vectors, from the same dimension vector space, and I take their dot product squared, then that's gonna be less or equal than their Euclidean norms squared, right? I can also take square root of this entire thing, not changing anything. Here, here it's interesting, so here this, this, this is an absolute value. This is an absolute value from a real number. So it says that if I take the absolute value of the dot product, then I will have always something less than the product of the lengths of the two vectors. So why would this be true? Have you, have you seen this before? It's, it's also used in calculus sometimes, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So let's see how we could prove that. It's not immediately obvious, I think, even though maybe you could see, you could already see why, why this is true. But let's, 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 do, let's do like a, let's do a, a proper proof of this. Proper proof of this uses dot products, obviously. So the first thing we can say that, so what you, let me, let me put in here again. What, what we are trying to prove is that the absolute value of b dot w is less than or equal the norm of v times the norm of w. I hope this doesn't confuse you. Sometimes I just put the real multiplication as a little dot. So here in this case, it's no dot product. Here in this case, it is a dot product. You should sort of always like infer the types of the things, right? What is, what is, what is the type of every symbol I'm writing down here? And if it's not clear, just ask. Okay, so the first thing I can notice, so if w happened to be zero vector, then the dot product has to be zero, right? Because the, because the length of it is zero, so whatever else I multiply, it still has to be zero. So, I, so this inequality is just zero is less than or equal than zero. So that's very boring case, that's obviously true. So I can assume that the length of w is greater than zero, it's positive, which means that w cannot be zero vector. Now, for now, we can skip this selection of alpha and I just just look look at this, look at this. So this is going to be an Euclidean norm of vector v minus alpha w, where alpha is some real number. Doesn't matter now, doesn't matter yet what real number, right? 
So because this is Euclidean norm square, this is length squared, so it's sum of squares, it obviously has to be greater than or equal than zero, right? So now I'm like working towards a proof of the cauchy schwarz inequality. So I start from this. So this is nothing but a dot product of B minus alpha W with itself, right? So this is equivalent to this. So also, also has to be greater than, greater than, greater than or equal to zero. So here I apply the distributivity. That's the first property I was bothering you with today. I was thinking, yeah, this is boring, but here, here we actually need it. So this, if I, if I, if I distribute these uh, minuses, then I get that this is, this is equivalent to V dot V minus two alpha V dot W plus alpha squared W dot W. You could even work it, work it out again. So this is already interesting because then alpha was like a free parameter, right? And that this is, this is, I guess, the only trick in this proof that I have to pick the alpha in a smart way. And the alpha I pick is this one. What turns out to work here is the alpha that is V dot W divided by the norm of W squared or W dot product with itself. So I pick this special alpha. This, this has to be true for any alpha, right? So has to be true for this alpha as well. Right? Here is like the, the little bit of a genius. <laughs> you will so I, I just plug this alpha in here right so what what happened here is I just took this this particular alpha and I substituted there so what does it mean what do I get I get this thing so now now all these things are scalars they, they're always for scalars but the alpha was chosen in such a way that look at this so here here I have V times w here is again v times w right so what what is this term this is v times w squared divided by w with itself squared uh, except that it's not squared so what i have here well so on the top the numerator is this and here here down I have w the w squared and here I multiplied by one so one of them so I again end up with w the w right here it was squared one divided by v dot v squared multiplied by v dot v so I get just divided by just one of them so here here I have minus two of those so this is the same Did you see that so these things, I can just subtract them. And what I end up with, if I put it then on the other, other side, I end up with this, that the V dot V, dot product of V with itself, <coughs> is greater or equal than V dot W squared divided by V dot W dot W. Now I can just multiply with it, so I multiply with W dot W, and I'm almost there, because this is, this is then, Euclidean norm of B squared times the Euclidean norm of W squared is greater or equal than V dot W squared. And if I take the square root and flip the order of the inequality, flip, flip it the other way around, I get exactly what I wanted to prove. So did you follow the proof in cauchy schwarz Really, the, on, the only tricky thing was the, the specific choice of alpha. And I'm pretty sure if you, if you spend some time thinking about that, you would, you would, you would build a geometric intuition what, what is actually going on and why, why this alpha has to be exactly this alpha. And that the, rest, the rest is just doing simplifications of these expressions. And after I simplify them, I just end up with this. By the way, I could, I could also write this, right? Because V dot W obviously is less than or equal than absolute value, right? If I have a number, a real number, a real number A, then quite obviously A is less or equal than the absolute value of A, right? Because either it's negative, then the absolute value is gonna be bigger, or it's positive, and then it's the same, then, it, then it's just equal. So the one thing 
the one uh, corollary, <laughs> the consequence. Oh, sorry, I can't pronounce it. Corollary. Yeah? Corollary is is this. If I take the absolute value of v dot w and divide it by the length of v and length of w, then this is less than or equal than one, right? I just took this and divi divide divided by this, so it has to be less than or equal than one. Which is, by the way, equivalent to the fact that the absolute value of cosine of theta has to be less than or equal than one because we had before our because from our geometric interpretation we know that this is nothing but this absolute value of cosine of theta and these these things just cancel itself so i know that absolute value of cosine of theta is less than or equal one <laughs> it's not super surprising result but <laughs> This 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 is what it like intuitively means. I guess. Okay, everybody happy about Koshi Schwartz and Bunyakovsky? <laughs> so we can move on to tri triangle inequality. It's another very basic geometric uh, relationship, and we actually here we actually apply the Koshi Schwartz Bunyakovsky inequality. It's it's applied all the time in calculus, but here here is one very basic example so the triangle inequality so let's start with a triangle so again similar triangle as we had before so at one vector w one vector v and their sum v plus w so again we can look what is the length of this side so this is just a the square we can look at the square norm of v plus w our distributive distributive rule tells us that we can expand it this way and then let's try to apply our Cauchy-Schwarz inequality to it so uh, I already told you that obvious so what we'll be working on is this term or what we will be applying Cauchy-Schwarz to is, is, this, is, is this term obviously the dot product of v dot w is less than or equal to the absolute value of that whole thing right that's what I was just saying just a real number so the real number is either negative and then the absolute value is going to be bigger because it's going to be positive or it already is positive and then the absolute value is the same thing so in all cases this is true and then from cauchy schwartz i ha i have that this is less than or equal than norm v times norm of w oops sorry right so this tells me that this thing is less than or equal this. So the first two terms I just copy. And the second term becomes 2 times norm of V times norm of W. So this is exactly what is here. So just explaining how, how, how this was derived. And now look, now, now we can apply the quadratic expansion for real numbers right because the norm of v and norm of w they are just real numbers right so he will he will use the thing i was saying before that x plus y squared equals where x and y are real numbers so this is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared so i use use this exact thing here so this is equivalent to norm of v plus norm of w the whole thing squared right and i have this interesting inequality so this is this is the result so let's see what does it tell us about the triangle i can even it's easier to square to take a square root out of out of that thing so it will be it tells us that the length of this edge so the length of v plus w is smaller than the sum of lengths of these two edges the length of this one plus the length of, of this one right and this is what is known as triangle inequality right so like if i, if I just denoted using numbers these are a b and c those are the lengths of these edges and a plus b always have to be greater or equal than c 
That's triangular inequality. And here, here it was an example how we can use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality to prove the tri triangle inequality. And it's, it works for triangle in any dimension, right? In for, for triangles in Rn. Those are like triangles we cannot possibly, or maybe we can imagine, but it's very hard to imagine. Eh? It's not the triangle that can be living in thousand dimensions, but this thing is still true. No way around it. Okay. Is it clear? Very, 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 very basic. Put, just putting together several basic things gives us some nice result. That's actually what is very cool about mathematics. Some people say that's like mathematics, is like the science of the trivial things and the tricky things. <laughs> and then you put them together and you get something nice. Can I move on? So now we have the norms. We have know some basic properties. We can define what is a unit vector. A unit vector just means a vector that has unit length, right? So if I take the Euclidean norm, I get one. Sometimes people note it with this head thing to just remind ourselves that this is unit length vector. Not, not always, this is not totally standard notation. So let's see. Well, problem is that's already written here. I was actually thinking maybe I could just like hide it like this. And then I could ask the question like, how does look like if I am in R2, if my axes are from R2, how does look like the set of axes such that the, or I could write it better like this. So my all, all vectors from R2, such that the norm of X is one. So how does this set look like if this is my R2? <laughs> it's a circle, yeah. It was already written there, so I think I slightly blew the point, but it's just a unit circle, yes. So how does it look like in 3D? What, what, if, what the set would be in 3D? Unit sphere. 4D? Unit hypersphere, right? Or whatever, whatever you want to call it, right? It would always, it would always be something. So, so if let's say 4D, right? So if I have a 4D vector, R4, and I, let's say that the vector has components x, y, z, w, now it would be just a set such that x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus w squared is one. For me, it's impossible to imagine eh, how, how it looks like. But from these formulas, you can actually reason about the properties it has. So that's, that's a, it's a, it's a three-dimensional manifold living in four-dimensional space. So if you think about like the generalization, you start from a unit circle in 2D, then you go to unit sphere in 3D, and then there must be something similar in 4D, right? This is actually someone asked me the last time, I think you did, about quaternions. And that's actually very important in quaternions, the unit quaternion, because they, they exactly live on this hypersphere, on this 3D hypersphere in 4D space. And it turns out that this has a very intimate relationship to 3D rotations. Yeah, there's a question. Distance between what? Well, the length of the vector. Yeah, so, so the, length, the length of the vector is just this, right? So the length of V, if, if my vector has, has coordinates x, y, z, and w, so that the length is just the square root, it's, it's, it's always the same thing. Just more dimensions there. This is, this is the length of the vector. Sorry? No, 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 no. Those are, those are. No, it's, it's right to be confused about it because if you were not, to, if you were not confused about four dimensions, that, that, that you are either art genius or there is something wrong with you. <laughs> I am also confused, and you really have to think about it. Like, what, what does it mean, right? And this is what does it mean. There are some properties of vectors in three D which are like not true in four D, right? Like in three D, for example. What was that thing?
something like that two parallel planes can intersect on trail yeah sorry i forgot that but there are there are total things that don't translate from 3d to 4d so that's good to know that this one does okay so we will probably manage to finish this yeah, so why did I bother with unit vectors? It's because they, they behave uh, especially nicely with it in the product because they, the lengths fall out because the lengths are just one. So it's more slowly. If, if I take in a product of some vector V with the unit vector U, so the hat means that the length of U, length of U is one. So if I take the dot product between the two vectors, one is arbitrary, one is unit, then what I get is let's 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 write it out this this one time so i get the norm of v then i could write the norm of u hat but that's just one right so i don't don't really have to bother so i'm cosine of the angle right so what does it mean on this on this picture so this is my arbitrary vector v and here is my unit vector u hat and there is an angle between them my theta angle then what is it? The length of V times cosine of that angle. Do you remember that from trigonometry? If, if I have a triangle and I take the long side and multiply it by the cosine of the angle, what do I get? Do you remember that? I never remember this. I have to go to Wikipedia to like remember this triangle. <laughs> I should remember this one. I get the length of this side. Right? If I have a triangle, this is A, this is alpha, and I do A times cosine of alpha, I get the length of B. I get, I get the length of this, this side. Right? And sine of alpha would give me this one, the tangent of alpha would give me the other two, and so on. So what, what does it mean if I do dot product of V times unit vector U? So I get the, this length, so I can interpret it as the magnitude of project after projecting this vector, orthogonally projecting it. So by that, I mean basically taking just the component of the vector in this direction, and the length is exactly v dot u, where u is a unit vector. Did you manage to swallow it, or shall I repeat it once again? So this way I can also, so this vector I could actually like split in two vectors, right? I can split it. So V, if, if, I, if I have some interesting direction U, U at, which is described by a unit length vector, then I can be asking like, what is the projection of V onto direction U hat and what is the rest, right? So now I already know the length of the projection of V onto U hat. And if I want to get the vector back, then I just have to multiply it with u again. Because this is, this is again, just remind ourselves of the type. This is just a scalar, and this is a vector, right? So if I do the dot product of v dot u and multiply it with u hat, I get exactly the component, another vector, which is just the projection of v onto that direction. And if I wanted the, the, ortho, the, the remaining part of v, all, all I need to do is subtract, right? I take, <coughs> take the b and I subtract the thing I just computed and I get the, the remaining part. So of course, if I take these two parts together and sum them, I get back v. Right? So this is basically about decomposing vector into one direction and the rest. So this is, this is orthogonal projection, very important thing in linear algebra. And this is like the orthogonal complement to it. And the last thing I want to mention today is a very simple thing. So in the special case, I have two vectors which are both unit length and I take their dot product. Then the length of u and length of v is one because they are unit length. So all I'm left with is the cosine. So basically, I'm looking at two vectors that are unit. That means in, in 2D, they are on the unit sphere. In 3D, they are unit circular. In 3D, they would be on unit sphere. And the dot product there tells me directly the cosine of the angle. So if I want to retrieve the angle, I could do arcus cosine of the dot product. And here I have the angle. 
Okay. So this is it for today. Do you have any questions? <laughs> so Monday there is Labor Day, right? So there is nothing. But we will meet again on Wednesday <laughs> to prepare some homework then so you get to do something. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I will stop this Yeah, no, I still haven't heard anything about the map lab. <laughs> Sorry.